So our topic uh, tonight uh, will be on the management of the of Spina. But first, I would like to thank the Saudi Society of Bone uh, and Marrow Transplant uh, for organizing uh, this session tonight. And also, I would like to thank the uh, sponsors of this event, uh, Novartis Pharmaceutical, uh, for uh, sponsoring the event. Uh, for the session tonight, it's with great pleasure uh, to have uh, a distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Walid Ghanima, uh, who will talk to us about how I treat the refractory ITP. Dr. Ghanima is the head of the uh, research and a consultant hematologist at um, Ostfold Hospital in Norway. He's also a professor in the Institute of Clinical Medicine at the University of Oslo. Uh, Dr. Ghanim has gained his medical degree from the College of Medicine University of Baghdad in Iraq. He joined Ostfold Hospital in 2001 and became a consultant hematologist in 2004. And he assumed his current position as head of research in 2014. Uh, Professor Ghanim's main uh, uh, research interest is in venous thrombosis and immune thrombocytopenia. He is a member of several professional societies and was the president of the Norwegian Society of Hematology between 2013 and 2017. He is well published in the medical literature as he has more than 100 uh, articles in the national and international peer reviewed journals, uh, for, for instance, the um, New England Journal, Thrombosis and Hemostasis, Hematologica, British Journal of Hematology, Blood, and uh, Thrombosis Research. So it's a pleased to have you, Professor Ghanim, tonight, and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jamal, for uh, this, uh, for your nice uh, and kind introduction, and uh, Let's have two words in Arabic. Shukran jazeelan ala di da'wa al-sharafan alqi muhadra al-akhwani sa'udiyin wa atmanna an ta'jibkum. Okay, let's uh, shift to English. Management of refractory ITP. Uh, well, I start by uh, going through what is the definition? What is refractory ITP, in fact? Um, there's been different definition for refractory ITP. The one, the one by Rodiguero for the in the in the, in the article that came in 2009, describing try, where they tried to standardize the terminology, standardize the terminology of refractory IT, of ITP. Um, uh, refractory was defined as uh, failed the ITP that failed splenectomy or have relapsed, uh, plus being severe. Uh, that means with bleeding or have a high risk of bleeding. In a very recent article by uh, Miltadios uh, and uh, Jim Bussell was the last author uh, on this article, they, def they defined refractory as platelet count do not respond to two or more treatments, plus there is no single medication to which they responded, and um, platelet counts very low and high risk of bleeding or accompanied by bleeding. In a French article of the French group, they, they define refractory asymptomatic chronic ITP not responding to rituximab, splenectomy, or TIPO. I think we have to revise this definition and use uh, unresponsive rather than uh, refractory and unresponsive to which agent or which therapy because as long as the patient respond to the fifth or second uh, the fifth or sixth treatment then it is not a refractory that's my what i think uh, we should always ask is it a true refractory or unresponsive we are dealing with or it's a misdiagnosis as you all know, we don't have specific diagnosis test or diagnostic test for ITP. It's a big challenge. Response to treatment actually is the only affirmative confirmation of diagnosis. It's particular IBIG. If the patient respond to our, uh, if, uh, if the patient respond to IBIG, 
this confirms in a way that we are dealing with ITP. Um, other treatments, to other treatment like steroids and TPO, actually many other diseases respond to, to, to uh, may respond to, to steroids or TPO. So it's not very affirmative as IBIG. Um, if several ITP treatments are administered with minimal or no response, it becomes less likely that the patient has ITP. Some general principles in managing multi-unresponsive patients. Always try to, when the patient, when we're trying two and three and four and we're not getting response, reconsider the diagnosis. Reassess the patient and reassess the need of treatment. Do we really need to treat the patient? If the platelet count is 15 or 20 and the patient is not bleeding, health-related quality of life is not um, uh, is not uh, uh, impacted or affected by the disease. All these aspects, we should always do uh, reassessment and and reassess the risk benefit of further treatment, because these treatments are harmful too. They have side effects, so we have to be sure that when we are moving to the next uh, line of treatment or the next therapy, we're not harming the patients more than benefiting it, and always. Uh, reassess the adequacy of the prior therapies. Have you maximized the dose or not? Now, in the this article in blood that I referred to, uh, which is a very good uh, review article on, uh, on refractory ITP, they reviewed the literature and based on uh, other publication, they concluded that only 50% of the uh, what we Consider as refractory, they are primary ITP. 10% they are MDS, 10% bone marrow failure, 15% inherited thrombocytopenias, and 10% uh, secondary ITPs, and some 5% drug in use. So if not 50%, not ITP, at least one quarter of them, they are not ITP. So history of recurrent infection may indicate immune deficiency. The history of first degree relative of low platelet count and dysmorphic features may indicate uh, inherited thrombocytopenia. High MCV may indicate MYH9 or Bernard Soler. Hypogamma globulinemia, immune deficiency. Um, lack of response to IVIG indicate, may indicate that we are not dealing with an ITP. Prolonged response to platelet transfusion may indicate that we are not dealing with ITP. Consider the, all these issues and think of, uh, uh, always go over the, uh, the, the history of the patient, see what the patient has uh, to, uh, responded to or not. Uh, what is the biology of refractoriness? Um, evolution to MDS, one, uh, probably the patient right from the start, we were dealing with MDS that's now more evident. Antigen epitope spread that the patient generate um, antiplatelet antibodies is directed to other epitopes. Upregulation of pumps that expel treatment molecules from inside the cell, making the patient uh, more uh, resistant to treatment effect. Conversion from primary antibody mediated to T cell driven, another uh, mechanism. And the mechanism that it really like is the expansion of log lift plasma cells in the spleen. And this is be becoming more um, interesting theory. And, and now uh, even anti-plasma cell therapies are entering the field of, I of ITP treatment. And we are going to start a phase two study to uh, determine the effect of darotimumab in ITP. So consider an extended workup, bone marrow examination, aspirate and biopsy, flow, morphology, cytometry, uh, flow cytometry, uh, all these, uh, virus screening if was not done uh, upfront, autoimmune panel if not done uh, upfront, uh, electrophoresis if not uh, done. Uh, some patients, particularly uh, refractory, they may have an MGUS. Uh, genetic testing, of course, whether NGS or whole exome gener uh, sequencing um, might help at some stage. If we give up that this is an ITP, uh, we should do um, uh, at least uh, either an NGS panel or exome sequencing to uh, find if it's a hereditary uh, uh, thrombocytopenia or other diseases. 
Okay, um, a French group looked at 37 patients refractory to splenectomy rituximab and two TPOs, so quite refractory patients. They found that and they had a comparison uh, uh, cohort, in, in, in a matched cohort. They found out that uh, the odds ratio for being a secondary ITP was about five. Uh, finding an MGUS was uh, six times more uh, or six-fold higher. Bleeding was more, more common and no response to steroid therapy uh, was uh, more evident in the, um, I mean, less response to steroid in the refractory uh, patients. What were the outcome of these patients? Why refractory is, matters? Because there are more deaths in, uh, a number of deaths in these 37 patients, uh, more severe bleeding, hospitalization, and the thrombosis. So actually we are dealing with a severe disease. Um, having covered the, the diagnosis and what should we do and what should we think, then how should we treat these patients? Now this is from the uh, the treatment pathways from the international consensus um, guidelines that were published at the end of 2019. Um, we can skip the initial treatment, go to the subsequent and the medical treatment, which is the, the ones with robust evidence. They have been robust, with robust evidence. We mean that um, drugs that have been evaluated in our randomized controlled trials, and we have the three TPOs, we have rituximab, and we have the fostamatinib. And those with less robust, uh, there are a number of immune suppression treatment or immune modulatory uh, treatment. I'll, come, I'll go over some of these. Okay, I think this way I'd like to present the treatment that way. Steroid IVIG, if no response, then we will go to rituximab or TPO, that is usual. If the patient is not responding to TPO, then be sure that uh, the, the, the patient's on optimal uh, dose. Uh, it doesn't help. Switch to another one, to the other TPO, add steroid, or do a combination uh, of. Sometimes the combination helps, but there is very little uh, evidence in the literature or even case reports in the literature about combination. I have very, one successful story with a uh, combination and two failures. So in one of three may help, at least in my hands. Uh, if the patient's already splenectomized, accessory spleen, look for accessory spleen. If not splenectomized, then we go to the next line of treatment. Then we have to, again, reconsider, re revise diagnosis and reassess diagnosis when we move to the next line of treatment. Fostamatinib is a good option here if you have it available. If not, it will be available soon. And then we have a whole bunch of expert investigational uh, uh, products. The PTK inhibitor is entering, um, is entering phase three study in a very re under, uh, refractory patient, 40% response we've seen. Um, FCRN receptors, the uh, neonatal FCR uh, receptor inhibitors, uh, uh, several of them actually, they're entering phase three studies. Um, complement inhibitors, very promising results. Uh, well, if, if you have this op, uh, possibility of including patients in investigational therapies, uh, do that. If not, try fostamatinib. If not, consider splenectomy. But don't rush into splenectomy for, before you're sure that you don't missing anything else. So do a good workup before you consider splenectomy. And if not, nothing helps then move to the uh, last, actually the last uh, uh, line of treatment where you have to combine, Mostly, most experts prefer combination of TPO with an immune suppressant or single agents like MMF, cyclosporine, dapsom, danazole, decetabine, and so. So I'll try to go over some of, uh, uh, quickly over some of these uh, therapies. Switching its effective. The switching, this is one, I'm showing you only one study from the French group. Romiplostim, switching Romiplostim to l pack gave actually a response in about 50%, for 6% of the patient. From l pack to Romiplostim, 80% of patients responded. So it's very, it should be, it should be tried before you do anything else. How about increasing the dose? 
Well, there's very little evidence, but we know in, 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 in aplastic anemia, we use much higher doses of l -trombopal. So this was actually not published, but it was um, an abstract at uh, ASH, I think, some years ago, uh, showing that five patients where they went to 150 milligram, three responded with either CR or PR. And you can see the one CR, the red one, and the other one. And it takes time before they respond. That's the same issue with combination. You need a couple of months before you get the, you be sure that's not responding or not. And definitely more data is required. How about the sick um, inhibitors? Uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, fostamatinib. Well, fostamatinib, what fostamatinib does here, uh, it blocks the psychoskeletal deformation uh, in the macrophage uh, or confirmation in the, micro, uh, in the macrophage that is needed to engulf the platelet, the opsonized platelets. If you inhibit this process, then the opsonized platelet will not be engulfed and um, phagocytosed. That's what we think how they work, but uh, sick uh, inhibition involves many pathways in B cells and T cell uh, function. So, um, what's what is the real effect? How would the mechanism? We don't know, but that's what we think. There's been two phase two studies. Actually, the two, no, th sorry, two phase three studies, uh, randomized controlled trials, and a one extension study. In these two um, uh, uh, studies, which called Z, uh, 47 and 48, exactly same design, um, the response as was defined by the um, primary endpoint, which uh, required a platelet count in um, at least uh, four of the six biweekly platelet counts were over 50, to call it a response. 18% responded in, one, in, 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 in each of the two studies, and only 0 to 4% responded in the placebo. Um, in the, um, those who were in the placebo, they went on medication and open label in the um, extension uh, part of the study, and 22% responded. However, uh, they added an intermediate response, uh, which is um, around 10 to 15% or, or 8 to 14% had an intermediate response. So adding intermediate to stable response, we end up with 40% response in, uh, with fostamatinib. Now, in these two studies, the inclusion criteria uh, or the, the, the included patient um, had a median um, treatment of six treatments previously. So they were quite refractory or treatment resistant patient. So having 40% is a quite good um, response rate. Um, I have actual experience with three patients with fostamatinib. Two of them responded. One had to discontinue because of diarrhea and one has been on treatment for four years. The third one did not respond. So that's our ex my experience with fostamatinib. It is still not available in Norway, but it will be within, a, within some months. Okay, it acts quite quickly and you can see here within two months you get the action, or two weeks, sorry, uh, they start to work and you see that uh, the upper two curves representing the stable and intermediate response uh, coming quite uh, quickly, whereas the placebo didn't work. The problem with, uh, with uh, fostamatinib is the side effects, in particular diarrhea and hypertension. 30% of the patient get diarrhea. And in some of these, you can uh, uh, manage it uh, with uh, Imodium or other product, but uh, agents. But uh, in in the in my case, my patient uh, with my patient was very resistant and severe. Hypertension, you have to um, uh, monitor the blood pressure while on treatment. Okay, so this is an option. Definitely, it will be available soon. It will will help us. How about combination therapies? Why combination therapy? This is back to another French uh, study with 30 multi-refractory patients. As I showed you, multi-refractory to splenectomy, to uh, two typos, and to rituximab. And they received various therapies here. Each of the upper boxes are different type of therapies. In the one, in the second one, these 
10 patients actually received TPO plus an immunosuppressant, and seven of the 10 responded either complete or, or uh, partial response. So this, in a way, makes us think that a uh, combination of, of TPO to increase the production of platelet, at the same time an immunosuppressant uh, a suppressant agent to, to um, uh, decrease immunity, autoimmunity, might be very good approach. Other patients who receive TPO plus corticosteroid or immunosuppressant therapy alone or supportive therapy with corticosteroid did not have that effect. So if we think there are a large number of combination and single aging therapy that has been tried in ITP and no way I can cover all these in 20 minutes or even in, in one hour, a lot of them. But if you really want to read about them, go to this reference and uh, have a look at the combinations and what responses. They divided the combination into the pre-TIPO uh, pre era, which that was uh, usually or most of the combination, including cytotoxic uh, agents or chemotherapeutic uh, therapeutic agent, whereas in the post-TIPO era included most of them uh, a TIPO and the recombinant TIPO, that's the Chinese product, where they, combine, they combine it with, with uh, other agents like danazole, atra, um, uh, and um, you have, um, yeah, most of these are actually uh, TIPO and, um, and immunosuppressant, but you can see the one uh, what I'm going to uh, go over quickly, the rituximab and the valimumab is a good one. Uh, it's probably very, uh, uh, would turn to be a good combination in the future. So this is study from uh, uh, Steve uh, Goodbrand's uh, doctor and uh, Jim Bussell. They uh, presented, they went over a th 18 patient, was a retrospective study, um, a 12 adults and, um, and uh, um, six uh, children. Um, they have failed in an average of 6.5 previous therapies, a combination of TPO plus cyclosporine or mycophenolate plus IVIG uh, gave a response rate of 70%. So here we're giving more evidence with there was a minimal side effect and, and not that much serious uh, uh, adverse events or serious infections. So more evidence that this combination of TPO and uh, immune suppressant uh, therapy is, uh, is really uh, might be a good solution. This is the study that from the French group that I referred to that um, um, the antibaf uh, belimumab and um, rituximab, these were not very refractory patients, by the way, but I just want you to show you the result of this. What, an what antibuff does is actually prevent the conversion of or the um, conversion of B cell into plasma cells. So you inhibit this uh, stage and uh, because plasma cell, if we deplete uh, B cells with rituximab and then plasma cell are still there and still producing antibodies, that we will not get rid of the disease. So with that, uh, in that study, and as I mentioned, only they, they haven't received rituximab and they were not splenectomized, but they're refractory to or unresponsive to uh, steroids and probably other medications, and there were um, um, 15 patients uh, or 14 patients in this study, and you can see they were they had 10 CRs actually, which is quite good, and two uh, and two um, uh, responses and three no responses. There were 15 patients, not 14. Sorry. So that might be a promising therapy. Another possibly promising therapy is, the from, uh, is, is a Chinese study combining danazole and atra versus danazole alone. And you can see here at one year, 63% on the uh, atra and danazole uh, versus uh, 26 in the danazole were um, showed a sustained response. Um, so, and they, uh, I mean, 63% on the uh, uh, the atra and danazole showed sustained response uh, versus 26 and they were uh, relapse free. 
So, uh, but this population was not very refractory. So it should be, the, the combination should be tested in uh, more refractory patients. How about single agents? There are a lot of single agents. Cyclosporin, azathioprine, MMF, cyclo, uh, um, tour inhibitors, tacrolimus. All these has been reports on and they are being shown to be effective. I like mycophenolate. Um, the, uh, this is study, which patients were quite refractory due uh, to uh, previous treatment, and um, you can see that 52% uh, responded. Uh, 14 had no response, 4 had um, response, and 11 had complete response in primary ITP, and the same number probably in, in, in secondary ITP. Um, this uh, in this study uh, that also I like to uh, I picked up, which I think that will be a promising um, another promising treatment is the citabine in adult patient, which really refractory patients again, and they uh, gave three cycle of three days of the citabine, and the response complete response were eighteen percent and partial thirty three percent. Sustained response at six months, 44, but went to 18, at, to 20 percent at 18 months. So most of the patients loses their uh, lose their response, and time to response is 28 days. So this is another possibility. Uh, I would like to end my presentation with a couple of tables and the reference where you can find a lot of information on these single agents and uh, how is the response rate in various studies and time to response. So these are a couple of, uh, of course we have uh, uh, autologous transplantation is a possibility, but it's rarely we, uh, I mean, I have never con considered transplantation in a, uh, in a patient with ITP. Uh, and we have so many treatments now that hopefully we can um, we can uh, uh, achieve response before we are resorting to this uh, uh, therapy. Uh, to summarize, reconsider the diagnosis, reassess the adequacy of prior therapies, reassess the need of treatment based on risk benefit evaluation. Um, so don't rush into a new therapy if you are not sure that the patient is in need of treatment. Um, and um, balance that or weigh that against the uh, harmful side effects of any new treatment. Use therapy with robust evidence whenever possible because we know the safety profile, uh, the mechanism probably, the onset of a, a lot of uh, information we know on these therapies and definite and consider combination of TPO and an immune suppressant if you um, um, if you uh, have no other choice or you don't achieve any response with, with single agents. Uh, uh, and definitely there is more need for research in this field. Uh, these are three references which uh, you can uh, uh, take a look at and in particular the uh, last one which I think it's a very good one. And finally I'll leave you with some pictures from Norway. Uh, the fjords, the midnight sun, the North Cape, and uh, the one in the right is my city where I live, is Fredrikstad. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, I'm not sure if Dr. Jamal is here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Walid. Um, excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, we would like to have the case presentation from Dr. Jamal. Um, perfect. Um, so to have the discussion at the end. Jamal, uh, we are not hearing you. I don't know if your if your connection.
All right, if you could bear with us for a minute so we could get Dr. Jamal connected. Maybe if you have a you know problem getting in, maybe uh, you could sign off and sign in again. Meanwhile, we could take questions, Dr. Jamal. All right. So, Dr. Walid, uh, until Jamal, uh, Dr. Jamal join us again. Um, all right. We've got we've got a couple of questions here we could address. Um, we have so any experience with uh, of a of a trauma bag. I don't have experience with Avatrombo Pack. I didn't participate in any of the Avatrombo Pack studies. Well, actually, I think it's only one study, uh, phase three and one phase two study. Uh, but it seems to be very powerful medication. So a very effective medication. So let's see how it turns uh, uh, when we have it available, if it's better than, uh, well, if it uh, you have high rate of response. Uh, but what I know uh, on Avatroma pack, it does not interact with food uh, and uh, with medications, and uh, there's no that liver yeah. toxicity. Right. So do you, uh, there's a question here about uh, going uh, with a single agent or combination, uh, combined agents uh, treatment. What's your preference? Of course, I, I mean, I'll try first single agents whenever that's why i said i switch tipos i increase the dose of tipo and uh, tried if as i mentioned postamatinib is effective if, if available try it if not you can try uh, mycophenolate as i mentioned that my preferred medication either single or in combination with people. Now, the problem is that when we combine and the patient responds, we don't know if the patient is responding to this one or that one. So after two months, and I have this, I, I experience this problem sometimes, if the patient responds, then we don't, we, we have to taper one of them to see if the patient really needs two medications. So try single agent as long and as much as possible before uh, you rush into a combination. Right. Um, yeah, another question here. I mean, you already covered this. However, you may need, you may just elaborate a little more about the role of auto transplant and um, in treatment of refractory or or non-responsive ITP. Uh, there. Um, there is some reports. Uh, there is, I mean, if it's really, really, uh, uh, you are sure that you are dealing with ITP or uh, there's no other solution to severe uh, and you don't have any other uh, option, then you may consider it. Uh, of course, you have to do a good risk assessment and uh, there's very few reports on on uh, on the number of uh, and the rates of allergies and transplantation. Yeah. Um, I don't have experience. I've never yeah. done it in or, or referred any patient to it. So uh, I don't know if anybody, if, if Dr. Ahmed, you have uh, experience or. Well, um, one of the cases we'll present now, I mean, we haven't, uh, we've been, um, you know, reluctant to consider yeah. auto transplant. Uh, we haven't seen many cases done and you know, exposing or the patient to uh, such, um, I think, higher risk uh, yeah. intervention um, would warrant. Usually, I mean, we have a number of patients, and I'm sure you do. Um, you know, running low platelets, yeah. they're non-responsive, yeah. doing well. Yeah, we're, I mean, we, I mean, we're tired of you know uh, exposing them to various medications and yeah. others, and they're just you know end up non-responsive. Now, would you expose these people? And, and, you know, they're benign, they're not bleeding, they have no problem. Um, yeah, we sometimes, yeah, we intervene uh, prior to surgical procedures or dental procedures, and we see them responsive to steroid or 
uh, IVIG transiently. So it's like you wanted to keep a treatment um, that the patient is responsive to to intervene when there is emergency yeah. or when there is a procedure. And, and that's a, also an issue if you are sure that you are dealing with an ITP, like a patient who had responsive, he responded did previously to IVIG or other ITP medication and is losing the response now. So you're more sure that probably this is it. You have done the workup and it's not uh, MDS, something else. You might, okay, I will might consider an aggressive therapy as autotransplant. But otherwise, if not responding to anything, I would be very uh, uh, reluctant to do an uh, auto transplant to that patient. I mean, I'm not a transplant uh, hematologist, but I would definitely have would discuss it with the transplant people um, before uh, uh, re referring the patient. Right. <clears throat> the question here um, uh, about what's the best combination um, um, to respond, um, who respond to a trombo bag, 75 milligram. Um, so what can we add? So there is, I so there is a response. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I usually add, uh, I mean, if, if I have, um, let's see if I've tried romiplostim, not working, trying re, uh, el trombo bag, uh, and not working, uh, I add, a, a, or the opposite, add a steroid. Five milligrams, sometimes they help. If not, I combine both of them for a period of time, also a month or two, uh, and see what happens. So I usually like to try the medication that I'm familiar with and feel uh, experienced with before going into it. And then if it doesn't help, I'll add MMF. That's my strategy. Right. And, and, and remind you, MMF takes a couple of months before you see an effect. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think Dr. Jamal is having a problem connecting again. Uh, maybe our um, um, uh, Noor, or uh, if you could communicate with him on the phone and see what's happening if he is able. He could use his uh, mobile as hotspot to connect. That could be, uh, sometimes it could work. Um, <clears throat> so here, um, we have a question here. From your point of view, which ITP agent is the best for chronic ITP in the era of COVID-19? Um, I think, um, well, this is, this is uh, if the patient has COVID and developed ITP or the patient is, a, is in a stable medication or you want to patient with ITP in the era of uh, COVID. Uh, if that is the question, uh, a trombopag I think is the best because um, you put the patient on 50 milligram, you don't have to um, um, start this um, uh, gradual dose increment of ramiplostim and the subcutaneous injection and all these might be to, so to, to, to reduce the number of hospital contact, give the patient a trombo bag and a 50 milligram and uh, well, most of the patient there respond. So uh, if not increase to 75 uh, milligram. Uh, so, so I think that is the best um, uh, therapy right now. It's not immunosuppressive. Right. It's, it's, Highly effective. Correct. So, what what do you have? I mean, what's your experience in uh, treating pregnant women uh, with again non-responsive ITP? Now, have you used any of uh, of the TPO agents or other agents? Yeah. Uh, we, we actually re re recently published a, a study in in, uh, um, in blood um, about um, 14 or 15 pregnant women uh, who were treated uh, with uh, either romiplostim and, and, or, 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 and thrombopag 
at different stages of pregnancy and there were no teratogenicity or problem, uh, fetal problem, thrombocyte problem. So, so uh, although yes. it is not uh, recommended, but it's quite, it seems to be quite safe. So, if the patient is not responding, Hello? Uh, Jamal, you're back now, huh? Yes, I'm sorry about this uh, te technical issue. Sure. So uh, we went over the discussion and some of the questions. So we could have your case if, you, if you're ready. Okay. Uh, Please. Just try to get the first slide. So basically our patient, she's uh, a lay a lady of 33 year old, a single female, who is normally fit and well, and known to have an uh, ITP since 1999. She presented initially with spontaneous bleeding and skin bruises, and um, she had no bath medical history of note otherwise, and she has no family history of blood disorders. So the initial investigations Upon diagnosis, uh, showed the platelets were less than 10,000. The rest of the DC was uh, within normal range, and the blood film was consistent with thrombocytopenia and no other uh, abnormality detected. The baseline investigation for uh, autoimmune screen all were negative. Uh, also, the uh, viral screen, Helicobacter pylori, was also checked and it was negative. Uh, now, at the time, in 1999, bone marrow was required uh, at presentation for, for uh, sake of diagnosis. She, so she had a bone marrow done, and that was consistent with ITP. Uh, generally, uh, the patient, she's not a bleeder. However, she did have an episode of retroperitoneal bleed, secondary to the hemorrhagic ovarian cyst. And the other episodes of bleed she gets every now and then when she had an excessive uh, menses. Uh, the initial treatment at the time of diagnosis, as usual, started with steroids. But within one year, that proved to be uh, uh, ineffective. So the year after, in year 2000, she underwent splenectomy. I hope you can see the table, the trend of her platelet count. Um, post splenectomy and that because that has made no impact on the improvement from her platelet count. So her platelet count remained between 10 to 20, but whenever she needed uh, uh, fixing her thrombocytopenia, yeah. she normally responded to uh, IVIG. Um, so for these years after splenectomy, uh, she remained thrombocytopenic, but in year 2007, received rituximab for the first time. Uh, and again, from the graph here, from the trend of the platelets, probably you see there's no response except one blip of uh, improving platelets count, and that's because of the IVIG. Uh, and in year 2008, or between 2008 and 2009, uh, she received immunosuppression. And that's... Um, that varied between azathioprine, uh, mycophenolate, FK, in addition uh, or in combination with steroids. But again, that didn't change a lot of her situation. So in year 2009, between March and May, she was tried on RCVP. So she had total four cycles. But again, as you can see, most of the time her platelets remained below 50. Um, between 2009 and 2011, she was tried on romiplostum, and there are two tables here, hopefully you can see them clearly. The, the left-hand side of the, uh, of the platelets showing she did have some response initially when she was started on romiplostum, but unfortunately she lost that response uh, in 2010-2011 uh, as her platelets went back to uh, a single figure. So romoplostum did not, did not work with her. That was followed by l trump bag, where she had it for a few months in 2011. And hopefully you can see the, um, the graph here. Her platelets were most of the time uh, below uh, 20. 
Uh, now, uh, at some stage, she was screened for possibility of an accessory, uh, accessory spleen uh, available, um, presence, and that was actually detected by ultrasound in 2009. And to give her the benefit of doubt, uh, she underwent uh, spleen accessory removal uh, in October 2011. But again, that did not improve her platelet count. Now, in year 2012, she was tried on amifostin, and as you are uh, aware, amifostin is um, a drug uh, initially identified by the Chinese, and I'm just showing the reference here of an article or a paper uh, which uh, concluded that amifostin may have a good therapeutic effect on ITP, especially in a refractory and elderly patients. Uh, in her case, after treatment of nine months on amifostin, again, that did not uh, make a difference. Uh, Alamtuzumab was another agent she was tried uh, in 2013, and again, her platelets remained uh, uh, below uh, below 10,000. Colchicine, which is reported to be useful in the treatment of ITP resistant to standard treatment, was also tried on her uh, for a couple of months between May and July 2013, and again, there's no response on her platelets count. So, uh, because she is not a bleeder normally, and with the failure of all the treatments she had in the past, it was thought probably to leave her off treatment for some time and see what happens. So she spent nearly three years uh, without any treatment. And as you can see on the, uh, on the table, the trend of her platelets most of the time is single figure. And that's, uh, that's also shown on the graph. So um, being off treatment did not make the situation worse. It's almost probably the same. And bortezomib was also considered in 2018. Now, um, I'm also here showing a couple of um, uh, papers on bortezomib, which is proved to be effective more on um, immune hemolytic anemia. However, a response uh, to patients with ITP also has been reported. But in our patients, it's the same. Um, the same scenario where her platelets did not improve and she remained most of the time below 20,000. So since 2018, so for the last two years, uh, she's been having an alternating treatment between romiplostum and l trombopag and, uh, and Professor Anim already uh, showed us uh, that the uh, combination uh, sometimes or, or changing over between the TPOs may have an effect. In her case, most of the time her platelet counts remain below 20,000. As you can see in the graph here, on a couple of occasions, she did have some improvement um, uh, on the platelet count, but most of the time actually she responds when she receives IVIG for one reason or another, mainly uh, for dental treatments or during the heavy menses. A uh, couple of points important to mention about um, her case that she underwent for all these years, she underwent bone marrow examination on three occasions. The first one at presentation which was consistent with ITP. Also, she underwent bone marrow in 2008 and 2010, and that was mainly to rule out any uh, uh, primarily bone marrow defect. On both occasions, she uh, shown hypocellularity, not great, but definitely hypocellular for her age but definitely there was no evidence of NDS uh, by morphology, cyt uh, cytogenetics, um, or fish. Also, she underwent uh, procedures during this period of thrombocytopenia, uh, mainly with IBIG uh, support, uh, where she had uh, drainage of abscesses one time, and ha she had frequent uh, dental procedures. She uh, sustained concurrent infections during all these treatments, one time with uh, Varsela Zoster, and the other occasion she had CMV reactivation. Uh, so basically, um, uh, this is the uh, treatment story for this patient. So what is next? Uh, Professor Ghanima already spoke about the um, uh, new novel agents, uh, Fostomitinib, um, so I'm not going to um, talk about these notifications since she had um, she hasn't been exposed to those. So maybe I should skip these um, 
slide and just uh, comment uh, on my last slide that the options available for her number one is watch and wait and that's um, she proved uh, to have fairly stable count she's not a bleeder but the question is for how long especially she's a female and she's at the age of uh, pregnancy child bearing age so that should be considered and the second point probably to consider is the uh, stem cell transplant uh, however um, um, what the condition reasonable conditioning should be considered and are we talking about allo or auto now we do know auto stem cell transplant proved to be successful in so many of the autoimmune diseases and itb uh, is one of the autoimmune diseases alternatively uh, allogenic stem cell transplant if we are looking for um, uh, uh, immune system re, um, um, uh, reconstruction uh, that also should be or or can be a, a valid uh, option but I will leave that for a discussion. I think this will be the uh, last slide of the case. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Jamal. Um, yes, very interesting case. Uh, that's, uh, we all have, if as severe as this or as reluctant to, or resistant to treatment as this patient, uh, but we definitely all experience or deal with very complicated unresponsive patients. But I want to be sure that she's responding to, still responding to IVIG? She does, yes. She when does. needed, yes. So actually that's the only treatment we have. Uh, and then uh, she's been, I mean, did you combine Altromopag and Romiplostim together? Yeah. Yes, over the last two years, the main treatment was just changing over, and at some stage, uh, she had the combination, and also it has been combined to steroids as well, the TPO. And it, it worked for some times and then lost response, or it's working all the time? I think the best response she had when she was exposed to Romoplastin for the first time, which was uh, 2013, I think. After that, uh, the response uh, short-lived, and uh, normally the platelets doesn't go more than 20,000, most of the time. Mm. And the doses were like maximum doses? Yeah, she reached 500 micrograms for the Romiplostum. For the l trump bag, she reached, uh, she reached the 75 milligram. Yeah. Of course, Romiplostum, if you, you, it depends on what is her weight, but you can go up yeah. to 10 she, micrograms. She, she's, not, she's, she's not a big girl. Yeah, okay, so that's that's the maximum. Um, have you done, I mean, any, any possibility this is a hereditary? I mean, she's responding to IVIG, so this is a strong indicator that we're dealing with ITP, but why it is so resistant? I mean, it's it's you have tried everything. Uh, I would definitely wait for costamatinib before I go to uh, transplantation, whether, whatever it's... it's uh, uh, Five. Uh, so um, you have postmodernism is going to be uh, available and licensed in, in, in uh, other countries uh, uh, than the U.S. Hopefully within the next month. So this is an option. Uh, but Trombopak is an option also if it turns to be more effective. So. I don't have a magic uh, solution here, unfortunately, but I would uh, try these uh, uh, before considering more uh, aggressive and toxic uh, therapies. Uh, but, but what's your experience with the auto stem cell transplant in those severely refractory I have, patients? I have no experience at all uh, with transplant. I never uh, referred a patient to a transplant, uh, actually. We were discussing this uh, um, while we're answering the question, so, uh, but there, are, if, if you go to the ABMT uh, site, you have, you can find, there's one article, I can send it to you on the um, experience and the number of uh, transplantation uh, and the success rate, but uh, consider also doing uh, NGS to find out if there is any um, hereditary component, 
uh, I'm not sure what other things we uh, anti antibodies autoantibodies have you measured them in a way or try to assess you have a good method well, yeah the screening results were negative okay that was done as a baseline now yeah. now the other thing has been tried on her she's she's rh positive so mm. anti d anti d, anti -D is, yeah. is, 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 is a possibility. However, as far as I know, that will be a short-lived response. I think the complications can be um, severe sometimes, so uh, it hasn't been tried on her. Uh, it's, were, a, it's a possibility, but you have the side effects, as you mentioned, hemolysis, uh, hemolytic yeah. anemia, and uh, some patients, you can get some patients into remission actually on, uh, on anti-D. Uh, but if not, then it has to be repeated, like IVIG. But I would, uh, if the platelet count, if, if she doesn't, she's not on any treatment now, or she's kept on a combination. Of she was with. Sorry, Yeah. yeah. If uh, the question is, is she uh, on treatment now? Yeah. We... Now she's back on L back. This was a few weeks ago. Only on Eltrombopag. Yeah. How about if you combine Eltrombopag and MMF and see uh, of them together work? I cannot be yeah. sure specifically for this combination, but she did have the combination of the immunosuppressive agents okay. with GPO at some stage in the past. Okay. Yeah, I mean, these, these are the yeah. options we have. We wait for fostamatinib, we uh, wait for avatrogopag. These are two new options, uh, promising options. And then if not, uh, any studies are you participating in? You can put the patient in. We, um, we are about to have actually participate in one of the studies, probably in... Um, uh, in the next three months, and should be a consideration for that, I yeah. guess. So, so if nothing helps, uh, auto transplantation is a possibility, definitely. I see Abdullah Jeffrey is uh, raising um, some suggestions here. Um, the so to have uh, whole exome sequencing, which I think uh, um, I agree. Um, yeah, that's and he, yeah. Sorry. And um, yeah, he thought that the megacaricides are not increased in the bone marrow. They are actually increased, I think, uh, as uh, Jamal showed. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, inherited disorders um, should be screened for as well. But I, I again. think I would I would do genetic testing in a way, whether yeah. NGS or whole genome or or exome uh, uh, sequencing. Just to, to exclude, but again, this this you have you have a number of indications that you are dealing with ITP. You have a number of them. Uh, the IBIG response, which is quite prominent, it's not like yeah, yeah. and then TPO is working for some time. Um, but I would I I would have done it definitely. And I would have done autoantibodies to be sure, also if it's positive, and especially if you have my path available, then do it. You're more sure that you're dealing with ITP if it's positive. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we are, I think we're coming to where they close uh, the end of our session, Mr. Jamal. Uh, yes. Now, I just. Uh, just need to, to um... there's a there's quick question here is splenectomy in patient and plate and patients with platelets less than five uh how safe is it uh well sometimes uh, you have to do it. that is the the surgeons of course you if you do splenectomy with uh low, very low platelet count the patient not responding you have to have uh, a good number of platelets uh in reserve and you have to get the best surgeon you have. And if that, I mean, experience in splenectomy, and if they accept to do splenectomy uh, on that low platelet, then, yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. There are still 70% are would respond. But remember, the 70% response rate with splenectomy, these were the days where we used to splenectomize in the second line. Yes. Uh, today, we are splenectomizing probably in the sixth line. So that's not there. Don't expect 60% response. It might be 20 or 30. Nobody knows because we are not doing it. I agree. I think uh, whatever second line, you will get the higher, uh, you know, percentage of response. Yeah. And whatever line you will use afterwards will get less, I guess, of uh, of success. Well, uh, because we're running out of time, I think um, we will have to conclude here. And um, there are a few questions that we uh, cannot uh, cover. Uh, but again, thank you, uh, Dr. Walid and Dr. Jamal. Again, so for, uh, if, I may, please. If, if I may announce the the uh, webinar of next week, please. Yeah, please go ahead. So hopefully next week we'll have the evolving fungal landscape of management of managing fungal infection in hematological malignancies, and uh, we'll have a distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Antonio Baliuka from uh, London, UK. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to join us. And uh, again, thank you the fabulous society of blood and marrow transplant and Milvart is the sponsors of the event tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.